Hi there, I'm Matthew Price, interventional cardiologist at Scripps Clinic in La Jolla, California. I'm joined today with John Volpe, a vascular neurologist at Houston Methodist, in Texas, to discuss the American Academy of Neurology PFO Practice Advisory Guideline Update. John, thanks for being here. And let's first, why don't you introduce yourself for the audience and, and talk a little bit about this practice advisory update. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me, Matt. It's, um, you know, I'm a vascular neurologist. Like you said, I'm the director of the Houston Methodist Hospital uh, Stroke Center here. And uh, as you know, as we know, we've been dealing with this question of PFO for it seems like decades about what does it mean? How does it apply to our patients? And uh, there's been uh, conflicting data and then some consistent data and it, was, it seems like it was time for the AAN to offer its uh, practice advisory. So um, I put together some slides, if you don't mind, I'll, sh I'll show those and then we can chat about what, uh, what the context means uh, in, our, in our practices. So we'll switch over to the slides and then we'll start. So this is uh, what we'll, uh, you know, call, I guess, the guidelines from the American Academy of Neurology. It was updated in April of 2020. <clears throat> and what changed? Why was this necessary? Uh, really, what changed was, was evidence. This is an evidence-based medicine statement. And in order to make a statement, there had to be new evidence. Uh, so I'll summarize briefly what that evidence is and what the, the committee uh, specifically cited. There was other data that I, I'm not uh, citing every reference that the committee looked at, but these were the highlights. And the first uh, was the RESPECT trial. And the RESPECT trial uh, will be familiar to those of us who read it back in 2013 as the preliminary analysis. Uh, at that point, there was a trend in favor of the device. In this case, this was the Amplatzer PFO occluder. And it was uh, significant, though, in the as-treated analysis. And that is not the, the highest level of the intention to treat analysis. And that, that led to muddying of the waters. Was this uh, good enough data? But then in 2017, the New England Journal published the 10-year data that showed that it was a significant outcome in favor of the device in the intention to treat analysis. And, and 2017 was really the big year for, for the evidence change here. So at that same year, 2017, the REDUCE trial came out. And the REDUCE trial also in the New England Journal was the Gore cardioform septal occluder. In that study, it was in addition to medical management versus antiplatelet therapy. There are uh, a number of little differences between the REDUCE trial and the RESPECT trial, but I'll highlight one big difference is that the medical management in the REDUCE trial was limited to antiplatelet therapy, as the RESPECT trial had more flexibility and allowed anticoagulation uh, based on the, the practitioner's uh, opinion. Uh, the 2017 reduced trial showed that primary endpoint was met in favor of device in that uh, primary intention to treat analysis. And so that was the uh, favorable study for device. And then the same year, 2017, the closed trial, and this was a rather uh, interesting three-arm study. It had a device plus medical management, which was antiplatelet versus antiplatelet alone versus anticoagulation. Another uh, little difference, but, but may have a, a big impact on how endpoints were, were met, was that the closed trial looked at the large shunts uh, that had uh, that alone got a patient in or a patient who had a smaller shunt with an atrial septal aneurysm. So uh, trying to enrich the population to get more endpoints in this study, and, and that uh, also was favorable for device in the intention to treat analysis. So it's a quick run through of the data. Well, certainly we can chat more on those studies and, and other uh, associated studies, but that was the, the, I'd say the foundation of what led to the, the evidence change here. With those studies, the, the FDA moved and uh, approved uh, the Amplatzer PFO occluder and the Gore cardioform septal occluder, uh, somewhat different timeframes in, in 2016 for the Amplatzer device and 2018 for the Gore device. But very interestingly, I thought that the FDA in some ways uh, foresaw the issues that would come up with these approvals and that uh, professional societies would have to weigh in on what they meant uh, and issue this statement, which I actually will quote verbatim. Uh, it says, but as the device labeling clearly states, 
patients need to be evaluated carefully by a neurologist and cardiologist to rule out other known causes of stroke and help ensure that PFO closure with the device is likely to assist in reducing the risk of recurrent stroke. So really, uh, you know, a call to diagnosis, an important role for the, for the diagnostic team uh, coming straight from the FDA and in the approval. The other uh, important aspect, which I didn't uh, highlight in, in the evidence-based uh, change is safety. You know, safety, of course, is the, the consideration that you weigh with efficacy. And in this case, uh, there, there are a number of things one can look at for safety, but the most important was atrial fibrillation. So atrial fibrillation was uh, at higher rates in device arm of almost every study. And it was uh, other procedural related device complications were uh, occurred and they occurred in similar uh, um, degree in the different devices at 3.9 and 4.2% from reduce and respect. Um, and the other uh, devices has, in the other studies were similar. So that, that led to the AANs uh, forming a really an expert panel, excellent panel to, to look at this and analyze the quality of the data clarify the proper approach for decision making and weigh the risks and benefits of device treatment versus medical management options. Uh, whenever one looks at a evidence-based medicine question, you should have a, a question in mind, an actual clinical uh, application that you're, you're investigating. And they, they set out two questions. The first was in patients with a PFO who have had an otherwise cryptogenic ischemic stroke, does percutaneous PFO closure reduce the risk of stroke recurrence compared with medical therapy alone? And the second question was, in patients with a PFO who have had a cryptogenic ischemic stroke or TIA, does anticoagulation reduce the risk of stroke recurrence compared with antiplatelet medication? So a question about medical management and device management. This, uh, when one looks at these evidence-based guidelines, there's, there's a bit of an alphabet soup of all these uh, uh, categories and levels. Uh, it should be pointed out that level A uh, means that a recommendation is what one must do, and that usually comes from class one studies. Uh, class one studies are the highest level randomized, now triple blinded, meaning blinded for patient, proceduralist, and the uh, outcomes, which we will not be able to achieve in a device study like this. Uh, so the next class would be something that doesn't have all of the class one categories. So in this case, these studies were randomized, non-blinded, -blind, and as a result, they have a moderate risk of bias. So those class two studies uh, would lead to uh, more often level B statements. So a level B statement would be something that one should do, a type of recommendation that would be expected to improve health-related outcomes in a well-studied population. And finally, the level C statements. This is the where the art of medicine remains, what one may do uh, different uh, aspects of care. You, they're not as well studied populations, they're less conclusive results, but there's a, a thread of evidence, there's an, an evidence that one should consider these uh, or may consider these uh, as part of their practice. So I'll summarize, uh, actually I'll start by saying that there was one level A recommendation and that is that you should have a baseline EKG in every stroke patient, which seems uh, very important. I, I can't imagine a patient getting through the ER without getting a baseline EKG for stroke, but uh, it is a must do. So everything after that was the level B should do statements regarding diagnosis and treatment. So first regarding diagnosis is that a neurologist with expertise in stroke should evaluate clinical data and brain imaging for an embolic pattern and exclude atherosclerosis and other high-risk and non-PFO causes such as hypercoagulability from antiphospholipid. So this really is a statement about the importance of expertise, the importance of really the proper diagnosis, the proper workup, and a complete workup. Uh, the statement includes uh, facts that uh, PFO is a relatively low risk of recurrent stroke, and if you identify any higher risk causes, those should be treated uh, in prefer over the, the PFO. The second should do statement, which I'm summarizing a few of the recommendations, is that a cardiac evaluation should include at least 28 days of rhythm monitoring. So this is a fairly concrete number. Uh, you know, we're often doing monthly uh, rhythm monitoring, but they've decided on 28 days of rhythm monitoring 
in at-risk populations for AFib. And there's some uh, uh, explanation of what an at-risk population of AFib is. It's really a patient over 50 who has some vascular risk or a patient under 40 who has many vascular risks. Or they have other characteristics on their, their echo or their EKG that, that lead you to believe that they're at risk of AFib. So for those patients, you should do 28 days of rhythm monitoring and you should do TTE followed by TEE to evaluate anatomical factors. The uh, third uh, should do statement regarding diagnosis is that well-selected patients should be counseled about diagnostic uncertainty and that the population prevalence of PFO is high. And this is, the, the, I, I think the real change is that PFO closure probably reduces recurrent stroke risk in select patients. So moving on to the treatment recommendations, the level B should do statements were that shared decision-making, you should have shared decision-making with patients and inform them of the risks and benefits of device and medical options. And that you should counsel patients in whom anticoagulation is a lifelong requirement that the additional benefit of PFO closure cannot be confirmed or refuted. So relatively neutral statement about PFO closure in patients that are obligated to anticoagulation. Moving from the should do to the level C may do, these are the less well studied, less well proven uh, statements uh, for diagnosis. And, and the only one for diagnosis was that TCD with bubble as a screening tool can be used prior to a TTE or TEE. And it makes sense for those of us who have used TCD. Uh, if you're going to do TCD, all you get is, is a shunt and you need uh, confirmation with TTE and TEE. And then the level, level C may do for treatments were to, you may recommend device closure based on the risks and benefits, that you can consider large shunts as signs of a higher diagnostic certainty and understand that conversely, there's less diagnostic certainty in patients with a small deep stroke. So what we would uh, previously have called the Kuhner stroke or small vessel disease, in those patients, you're less certain that they have a uh, embolic type stroke. And they, sit, and they state that there's an unclear role for atrial septal aneurysms in small shunts. The other uh, level C may do for treatment is that you may offer PFO closure to patients who are over 60 if they do not have the typical risk factors for atherosclerosis, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and diabetes. And is specifically in this population after AFib has been evaluated. Again, on the other end of the age spectrum, you, can, you may offer PFO closure to patients under 30, even if their stroke appears small and deep in type, if they do not have typical risk factors. So as a statement recognizing that an, a patient under 30 is not typically accumulated atherosclerosis enough to, to create lacunar infarcts, so they should be considered as a possible atypical presentation of an embolic stroke. And the, the last may do for treatment is that you uh, may treat medically with antiplatelet or a direct oral acting anticoagulant or a vitamin K antagonist such as warfarin in your non-closure patients. So really, again, neutrality here regarding medical management. So I, I can't help but uh, offer my thoughts on the, uh, the guidelines. We will have, a, that'll be the, the major part we talk about. I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts too, Matt, but I'll, I'll jump right in and say my uh, first thought was that it should, I, I was a little surprised that they did not specifically mention lifelong antiplatelet therapy in patients after device closure. I, I, I guess that's presumed. That's understood that in any patient who's had a stroke or TIA, lifelong anti antiplatelet therapy is already in secondary stroke prevention guidelines, but it would have been, I, I think, worthwhile to, to put that in as well. In my, in my uh, biased opinion, I would say I would add a level C statement regarding follow-up imaging in patients in whom the decision to close is not made within six months. In other words, a lot you know, happens over time and you can gain more data and more information by doing follow-up imaging if the patient just happens to be coming to you uh, as a second opinion months after their initial event, or if they're just not sure what they wanna do and they wanna think about it and come back in the future. Uh, this is an ideal time to do follow-up imaging, I think, and look for that silent recurrent ischemia, which may point you to a different diagnosis. Um, and then my last point, and I, I realize I've harped on this before, it, it, we really should drop cryptogenic stroke from this discussion. 
Uh, cryptogenic stroke is uh, becoming an archaic term. Uh, I think our nomenclature has moved towards embolic stroke related to, to embolic stroke of undetermined source, ESIS, and then we should add to that the subcategory. Once you know the, the source, it could be an embolic stroke related to PFO. So with that, Matt, I, I've, I've taken up my more than enough time. I'll, I'll uh, let you weigh in on what some of your thoughts are on the, uh, the this update. Thank you so much, John. Really great, comprehensive discussion of a fairly complicated um, practice advisory. Um, and there's just a wealth of data in that advisor, advisory. So thank you very much. But I'll throw it back to you just first. So just step back. What's your take? Do they do this right? Are there things you think? You mentioned the things about the nomenclature. I agree with you totally. Um, the, the conversation about lifelong medical therapy, even after PFO closure is a discussion we can have. But do you think they got everything pretty much right? Would you call this um, you know, 85% right, 100% right? Where would you land it? Yeah, I, I think I give the panel, I, I would put it differently. I would say that I think the panel made uh, a fairly a typical and very thorough and accurate evidence-based statement. And I think that we're, we're used to reading review articles as, as a summary of data. And that's what we look at review articles. And we sometimes forget that in many ways, guidelines and practice advisories are themselves review articles. They're, uh, they're opportunities to get the data uh, from a, a panel or an expert or a team of experts and hear uh, how they sift through it, how they select, how they deselect studies. And to me, this sounds very, uh, very accurate in terms of the assessment of the data. That it's uh, in our world, level A cl or class one data is pretty rare. I mean, especially in secondary stroke prevention. When we look at acute stroke management, we have some level one data, but for the most part, our secondary stroke guidelines will rely on this kind of you know randomized, um, not fully blinded data. Right. I think from a cardiologist perspective, and there may be many cardiologists listening in now, if you read that practice advisory, very different from how guidelines are structured in the cardiology community. And I do think I agree with you in that the PFO trials by default will not get the highest level of recommendation of these guidelines because they're not blinded. And very hard to do a device versus drug trial where the patient is blinded. I mean, that's a sham placebo trial. You'd have to have placebo drug in both arms, potentially very challenging trial. And, and so um, that's the first off. And I think that the, the neurology practice guidelines are really historically have looked at drug versus drug trials versus device versus drug trials. So, I mean, that was my, my first takeaway. First, I, I think it's a great practice advisory. We'll talk about why it's important and, and how it should influence how we take care of patients and the, and the, the heart-brain uh, team, hopefully, that dynamic. I do think there are certain things that, that may take the cardiologist aback. For example, when they say that PFO closure probably reduces the risk of stroke. When you have two large randomized trials that met their primary endpoints um, and a third trial, which also met its primary endpoint. And they had to say probably, I gather, because of the level that the clinical trials reached in terms of the robustness of the evidence. Yeah, as you know, when we're looking at evidence-based medicine or really clinical trials, the first question we always ask is, what's the event rate? You know, what's the event rate of the disease we're studying? And, uh, you know, for, uh, luckily the event rate is, is low in patients who've had uh, PFO related stroke for the patients, but un it's unfortunate when you're trying to study this disease. And like I mentioned, I, you know, I started doing clinical trials in PFO in 2007, and even that point, the study was well underway. And so this is you know, 13 years of trying to study this disease to get to a point where we have a guideline is, is pretty daunting. And that, that means because of the low event rate, you're not going to have you know, what like a cardiology mega trial is going to have in, in terms of accumulating a lot of events. You're going to have you know, 10 to 20 events in, in a population of 600. And uh, just discerning, that's where I think that probably comes from, that you're, you're, you don't have that large pool of events. And I agree, and I think that's really the way you have to look at these trials. I would say also, 
Um, I want to bounce off you your interpretation of their interpretation of shunt size and its treatment and the treatment effect of PFO closure. And just stepping back, I'll give you my, my pitch first, or my, my, my perspective, not my pitch, my perspective, is that at least one of the trials, there's really three trials. One of them only looked at large shunts. That's the closed trial. The defense PFO trial, I think they included a little bit. That was also only large shunts. So I one trial, the reduced trial, showed a interaction between shunt size and treatment effect. And the other trial, the reduced trial, um, so the respect trial showed a difference, but the reduced trial did not. So I think that taking the statement you just had to heart, meaning that are, the event rates are not high, the total number of events are relatively low for big trials. I think it's a stretch to try to make hay out of shunt size because you're looking at even smaller subgroups. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I had a couple of thoughts. Um, I think that we always have to, with, with statements like this, every word matters and every term matters. It has been really vetted by uh, the group. So what I would, my interpretation, if you really look at it, is that this is a statement about diagnostic accuracy. This is not a statement about pathogenicity and outcomes that the, this, the way that the recommendation is, is worded is that you are more likely to be accurate in your diagnosis when the patient has a large shunt and an atrial septal aneurysm, and that the, the likelihood of recurrence, they, they, they really didn't specifically go after saying that, it, and I would agree with you. I think that um, my, my big concern about shunt size is always just the technical factors. Exactly. You know, you, you really don't know what the shunt size is from one operator to the next, from one from TTE versus TEE versus TCD, that you can have four different shunt sizes for the same patient. Yep, I, I, I totally agree. And I think you're, you're looking at the wording is absolutely correct. And, I, and that's an that's a, a, a insightful statement. I want to also just pick your brain about something interesting you said about the duration of therapy after PFO closure. And then also they, they provide a similar level of um, recommendation, I guess, based on the evidence um, that either antiplatelet therapy or anticoagulation therapy can be preferred. What are your thoughts about long-term medical therapy with, with an OAC in, in a young population? So. Yeah, that's, that's a very difficult question because the, all the trouble that um, comes from doing an event, a low event rate study in devices is, is the same for medical management. And so the medical management has had just very wide confidence intervals. But if you take something away uh, from the old Coumadin studies and from the DOAC trials now, is that the, they've all been directionally consistent. They've all been directionally consistent in favor of anticoagulation. For the most part though, they've shown a, a pretty significant bleeding risk and that, that efficacy is, uh, depending on how you see the patient, either outweighed by the safety risks or worth it in the safety risks. So anticoagulation is really a question about long-term safety. So if you have a patient in whom you think they're hypercoagulable and you're restoring them to neutral coagul uh, coagulation status, then it probably is, it, it would be a, a proper safety analysis. In a patient who isn't hypercoagulable, adding an anticoagulant for life would seem to accumulate the additional risk, especially at, at full doses. You know, mm -hmm. if we look at the, the one study that, that I think is out there that uh, there's two actually that were purely anticoagulation studies without device, respect ESIS and navigate ESIS. Uh, respect ESIS was full dose, um, and that was the uh, dibigatran. And in that uh, study, they, um, they, there was neutral. There was no neither efficacy. Uh, in, there was no efficacy advantage. In navigasis, if you slice the data down to only the PFO patients, which was only seven percent of that study, you do see a, a directional trend that was statistically significant. But again, this is a subgroup analysis of a negative trial. Uh, and, but a safety is also outweighed in that study of fifteen milligrams. So, of rivaroxaban. So. You know, I think that there's a strong safety statement there that, that full dose anticoagulation over time uh, 
is uh, a pretty steep price to pay, especially the average age of these patients is 45. You know, we're talking about three, four decades. Got it. Well, um, that's a really a great interpretation of the, uh, the documents and questions we have to move forward. I, let's shift our discussion a little bit. Let me ask you a question because uh, this is what I always uh, wonder about is that what happens when you're sent a patient who has had a stroke and a PFO and you're, the, the patient is being referred from any number of uh, general neurologists or general cardiologists, how do you approach the, the, the workup on that patient? Is there a team you typically use or how, uh, how does this guideline give you uh, you know, some thoughts about what that might look like or should look like? So I, I think that it is so critical that a team approach is used here. And for structural heart disease, we talk about the heart team. For this uh, type of clinical scenario, I like the term the heart brain team or the brain heart team, I guess we could um, uh, call it. So I really think it's important twofold. One is that a cardiologist who's, who's implanting these devices has some basic knowledge of stroke physiology and, and um, stroke etiology, but also partners with a stroke neurologist, a vascular neurologist, to make sure that the event, the, the, that a cerebral infarction has occurred and it fits with a potential paradoxical embolism. Because the more you delve into this, there's, there's stroke mimics, there's stroke chameleons, there's, there's strokes from other sources that, that as a cardiologist, I, I may miss. And I, so how we do it at, at Scripps Clinic, it's really a virtual team. We don't have a day where we see the patients together, but um, if a patient comes to see me who has not seen a neurologist already, I will make sure that that patient is seen by a stroke neurologist. Um, and then we, we talk together about that. I also make sure that all the studies have been performed. So we have a nurse practitioner who coordinates it. So was a full a head and neck imaging performed? Was a good bubble study performed? Or be it a TTE or a TCD? Was a TE performed? All these things, lab get all the information and then get together and say, hey, you know, um, do we, in this patient, um, is this patient a reasonable candidate for PFO closure? Other people in our group, in our, in our heart team, are, are arrhythmia specialists. And you mentioned before about um, a 28-day monitor in our last segment. I think that's really a great recommendation by the neurologist is to have at least a 28-day monitor. But there are times, not uncommonly, where, you, where one may consider longer monitor. Um, and you talked also about that baseline EKG. Is the PR interval uh, prolonged at all in the absence of, of AV nodal blocking agents? That puts you at risk for atrial arrhythmias. Is the left atrial atrium dilated on the transthoracic echo? These are all, is the patient maybe in their 50s, not in their 30s? These are all um, clues to perhaps long-term monitoring with an implantable monitor might be a first step before uh, submitting the patient to transcatheter PFO closure. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess I'm a, I'm a neurologist. So I'm going to sum up what you said is that you don't want patients who have a sick heart. You, you want them to have a structurally healthy heart. Uh, yes. I mean, I, I think we also sometimes, um, I don't want to, there, there are these rare patients that have problems where a PFO maybe should be closed in the setting of other problems in the heart. Um, that, that's the exception rather than the rule. Yeah, and I think that from the neurology side, it's the same um, approach. We don't want patients to have sick brains. We don't want them to have, you know, an abundance of, uh, you know, flare hyperintensities. These would be our white matter disease of the brain that they've accumulated from uh, atherosclerosis. We don't want patients to have had, you know, a, an abundance of uh, everything in one vascular distribution where you you think, oh, there's a diseased vessel there or, or something like that. So there's a a lot of, uh, you know, really it does take experience. The, the, you, you have to have seen uh, dozens of these patients and probably dozens per year to keep up with everything. Uh, having a, you know, if you're a, 
neurologist who does ALS, you believe that the patient should be seen in an ALS center of excellence. If you're a MS specialist, you believe in MS centers of excellence. I, I think that this is a stroke center of excellence kind of referral, that having the opinion of someone who has their hands wet with stroke all the time is important. Right, and I also think um, having a cardiologist who has experience in reading echoes for the purpose of PFO evaluation. As you had mentioned in our earlier segment, not all bubble studies are created equal. So is there a patient who is highly suspicious for an embol a cardioembolic event in terms of their neurological findings, but, they, but has either not had a TE or has a bubble study that's negative, but clearly was a, a, a subpar um, or a technically inadequate uh, study. So that's, it goes both ways. Yeah, and I think it also speaks to the patient, you know, we think of these as a bit of a bell curve, you know, there's the patients who are very typical of the, of the studies, they look like the patients in the studies, they're that, you know, 40 something year old without a lot of risk factors. However, there are patients on the extremes, you know, you, you, you may see that 65 year old, and you want to know you're doing the right thing, you want to make sure that that really is the patient in whom a PFO is worth closing in someone who's um, over the, the typical age. And on the other end, you know, that 18 year old, believe it or not, this, even though that's the kind of the poster child of PFO is the you know, 18 to 30 year old, it's actually not that common. And you really need to have your antenna up when you see that patient that you've, that you've looked for uh, other causes and you, you've, you've evaluated that patient properly. I, I mean, I had one patient who was sent to me um, without seeing a neurologist for white matter changes, neurological symptoms, was eventually diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, right? That may seem, as a neurologist, maybe that's an obvious diagnosis, but if a patient is seen in the ED, gets some MRI scanning, is told they have a PFO, they get sent to a cardiologist, and there's, no, there's not a neurologist who's in that train of evaluation, something like that can be missed. Yeah, and I think one takeaway, it's not in the guidelines, but it, it is in the guideline, is that uh, these, should pro these uh, devices should not be placed at the time of the index event. In other words, when the patient is admitted and they're found to have an event, it, it, you really have to take a lot of caution in that patient that uh, there, there may be a rare exception. I would say we do have one to two cases a year where we've seen enough of the patient beforehand that they have a stroke. We, we might consider closing them during your hospital stay. But for the most part, this is a, a case where you want the patient and the doctor have a little bit of mental space to give time to probably have their 28-day monitor, uh, probably have some time to think about the risks and benefits, and then for the you know our mental processing to make sure we, we've done every, checked all our boxes and thought about it. Agreed. So let me throw a question back at you, John. So um, how do you get for a neurologist? How is this practice advisory change important compared to, say, the earlier recommendation? And, and um, should this really change? It seems that this is a very different advisory than it was several years ago. Yeah. There, um, so the, the main difference is that when the advisories came out after 2013, basically stating that they should not be closed. Those were, recommend, those, were those uh, level three recommendations against closure unless the patients were in clinical trials. Th this is a sea change. This is going completely the other direction saying that they should uh, consider for probable benefit. Um, so that, that's the most important thing that we, we can actually impact the health outcomes of the proper patient and we should intervene in the proper patient. That, that's, the, that's the takeaway. There's practical issues that you, you know how it is dealing with insurance companies and dealing with um, you know, payers that we have uh, run into this circumstance where uh, they will point to these uh, older guidelines that are now out of date and, and give uh, difficulty for actually having procedures performed for proper patients. So having a, a, a professional society standing behind a recommendation is, uh, is helpful for those, those payer issues. So John, so tell me, we talked a little bit about the, the acute stroke patient. So let's say um, a patient presents her on the, on the stroke team. What is, your, what is the basic workup you do for a stroke patient? And where does it veer into the workup for a, a PFO-related stroke? 
Yeah, I think that um, the, the, key, the cornerstones of our evaluation, especially in this population, is, is we must have an MRI, that, and especially an MRI that's positive for ischemia. In, in the, again, there's always a bell curve, there's always going to be extremes, there's always going to be uh, the value of experience to consider a TIA patient. Uh, but the TIA patients were studied in the closure trial, that was the, the first one, and that was a contamination of the population with non-ischemic events, and that caused a negative trial. So for the most part, we don't want the TIA patients, we want the positive MRIs. And then uh, now we're really doing vascular imaging uh, at the point of entry at the ER. And so we have to look at those vessels. We have to make sure that there's not uh, a luminal problem, whether it's with uh, stenosis from a plaque or dissection or other, you know, vasculopathies or vasculitides that can affect uh, patients in this, this age range. So we, we, we have to have vascular imaging. We have to have uh, a brain imaging. And then we immediately turn our attention to the heart. You know, there's going to be some either cardiology consult or our own interpretation is that a stone cold EEG and a stone cold echo, well then, you know, a neurologist can, can take that. But any abnormality, I would call up our, our friendly cardiologist and say, hey, can you, uh, can you look at this heart and tell me, uh, what do you think of the valves? What do you think of the, uh, the rhythm? What do you think of the, uh, the structure? Is there anything that uh, could, could be a source of emboli? And then the rhythm monitoring. Terrific. Um, and um, I think it's important as well in terms of the cardiologists who are, who are involved, because much like the neurology community, where only now are there practice advisory guidelines that, are, that have in the appropriate tempered tones engage the concept of PFO closure in the right patient. The same is true in the cardiology literature. So to make sure that in that team of physicians or, or um, clinicians that cardiologists who are aware of the data for PFO closure are also included so that um, people understand where PFO closure fits in the paradigm versus medical therapy or, or, or other uh, workup. Yeah, can, can I ask you a really hard question? Sure. Uh, this is one that, that uh, I think we all struggle with from time to time, is the somewhat desperate patient, the patient who is frightened, the patient who's had an event, the patient who's coming to you as a maybe a second or third opinion, is, has heard that they've had a PFO, has maybe been told uh, no by another provider, and uh, how do you approach that patient? What, if anything, does this guideline help you with in, in that case? And I'll give you my thoughts as well, but I want to hear from you. Well, I think another thing you mentioned that's so important is this TAA, okay? Is that it's so important that in an MRI you see evidence of cere uh, cerebellar ischemia or infarction. Right? And that's a big, for me, that's a huge takeaway from the trials is that you got to identify something that you're preventing. Okay, with, with the closure. So that TAA alone does not buy you PFO closure. Of course, there are extremes and there are situations and there is where with a neurologist, we work really well together to figure out what those exceptions are. So, but um, I think one of the things about a PFO is in a stroke or some sort of neurological syndrome is this anxiety that I have a time bomb in my heart and if I don't get it addressed, I'm going to have a stroke. Um, and um, I just think it's really patient education. I think guidelines can be important. I think um, having, um, that's where the neurologist working together with the cardiologist. So you're on the same page. I think that's really important as well for these teams, be it the heart team for structural heart disease or the heart brain team is, I mean, I discuss with the neurologist before I give my final recommendation to the patient. I may disagree with a neurologist, but I work that out so that we provide a consistent message to the patient. Yeah. Because that patient is freaking out is because they've had inconsistent messages yeah. from doctors and from the internet and from their friends and so forth. So that's, I think consistency is important. Yeah, and I think that that's what really any of us, when we're, if we're ever patients and would wanna also hear is that sense that we've thought about you. We've put it to the 
highest level, the gold standard cardiologist and neurologist. And we've, we've talked about you and we've looked at it and we've, this is what we see your prognosis as, as and it's, you know, if we're not closing it, it's probably that we see your prognosis as very benign, very good, and we don't want to expose you to risk. Uh, on the other hand, the, we sometimes see the other extreme, the patient who's reluctant, the patient who uh, comes to us uh, because a family member or somebody has said you have to, and it also gives us a framework for that conversation to say, we have really looked at you uh, and said that uh, this is something that uh, would probably benefit you if it's the proper patient. And on the flip side, I would say, and it's important for neurology, I, I would, I'd recommend neurologists go watch a PFO closure. That in the scheme of things that we do, <laughs> um, this, it is not, it is in the scheme of things that are done in the cardiac catheterization laboratory, this is one of the more straightforward and, and more and quicker procedures, uh, skin to skin, that we do. And it should be done in the right hands, same day, intracardiac imaging with a very low um, complication rate as seen in the clinical trials. So um, there is that. So that's what I also, for patients who the team really thinks would benefit from closure, they're scared of the procedure, worried about the procedure, to really reinforce that this is not open heart surgery. And of course, it's a, device, a lifelong device in the heart. I'm not trying to minimize that at all. That's a, another important factor in the, in the discussion. To also understand one of the reasons why the FDA approved the device in young, otherwise healthy patients is that its safety profile is excellent. Yeah, and I do punt really to our cardiologists on the AFib question. So I, I'd like to, I guess, hear from you. When you uh, hear from a patient, I'm worried about AFib, or if you hear that, uh, say, that main safety issue, how do, you, how do you frame that when you talk about the risk with the patient? Well, I think it's an important thing to upfront discuss. I also step back and say, okay, let's just say there is a low, there is a low rate of periprocedural atrial fibrillation, that the positive results of the trial were seen in that context. Um, so I think there are, are there are, um, so I, I, I fully, I'm quite transparent when I discuss with patients that there is, and I probably, I, I try to, um, under, but under deliver, under, I, I undersell and over deliver. Okay, so I say I say a solid 5% risk of having atrial fibrillation, um, a higher risk of having palpitations, extra heartbeats, feeling a fluttering in the chest. That in general, if you look at the data, in general, these events are self limiting and are not highly morbid and do not require long term oral anticoagulation. But if you do enough PFO closures, there'll be one or two patients have persistent AFib that you're going to have to do a cardioversion or has to be on several months of oral anticoagulation. Um, so, but I, I think, if, again, if you lay it out like that and understand that despite that low rate of incidence, there's still a benefit with device closure, most patients are comfortable going forward. Yeah. And I think also for them to hear that this is a, you know, that the benefit was seen over two years for the most part, uh, and that you know these are uh, like you said transient events that, that occur in most patients and resolve within ninety days, and uh, they're often uh, you know left with with a long term benefit. Yeah. Great. Um, well, uh, should we uh, wrap up? Yeah. So so tell me, John. So. Um, just tell me your, your maybe just a key takeaway from you and and how um, these this practice advisory may be solidified the way that when you see a patient um, with a stroke or with an unidentified cause, how has this changed the way that you approach those patients? Yeah, I think I'll start by saying that with any guideline, anytime a new guideline comes out, I have to say I always feel a little underwhelmed. <laughs> there, there's very few guidelines that come out that just really surprise anyone. And I think that, that that's the tendency and it's because this is a, a statement about 2000 plus patients in these studies and they're summarizing the median. And when, when you do that in evidence-based medicine, you have a lot of clauses, you have a lot of conditionals, you have a lot of maybes and, uh, diff and, and levels below must. And so that, that's always my, my takeaway from guidelines. But if you, if you peel that back and, and you really look at what we have here, 
is we have a, we have a turning point. We have a turning point from uh, this isn't helpful to this is very likely beneficial in the right patient and uh, ought to be part of your your treatment paradigm. And uh, like anything, it's all about the accurate diagnosis with the right patient. Uh, we don't put uh, you know we don't do carotid endarterectomies in patients that don't need them. We don't do stents in patients that don't need them. We we don't do devices in this case in patients who don't need them. So clearly emphasizing diagnosis that's that just is you know music to my ears as as a diagnostician uh, that 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 comes first and then treatment is available for that patient population. And, so, and from your perspective, yeah, and I, I agree with everything that you've said. I, I think. Um, it, it has shown the evolution of the data and the way that we should treat these patients. And I think it, it, the multidisciplinary approach is just so important. In fact, those guidelines, the practice advisory, the co-authors were both cardiologists and neurologists. Um, and I think that every uh, cardiologist or implanting cardiologist should partner with a, a stroke neurologist. And if you're a neurologist, a practicing neurologist out there, whether you're in a hospital, in an academic center, or in the community, is to partner with a cardiologist who's also knowledgeable and excited about this space to work together to make the right call because it's all about patient selection. It's not every patient with a PFO, um, but there are patients out there who have a PFO related stroke who will derive, will very likely derive benefit from PFO closure over the long term. So I think just building bridges, right? And like this, this webcast we have now, um, yeah. you're, above me, you're above me on my screen, but um, I think we should be equal partners. Um, yeah, we're equal on my screen. <laughs> yeah, and I think that the message for, um, really for the neurologists that are listening is we can't delegate this responsibility. We're part of it, we're in it, and we're, we're you know, we're, uh, the important first step of the, the proper diagnosis. So uh, seeing a PFO, seeing a stroke, and asking the cardiologist to sort it out, that would be uh, an antithetical to these guidelines. These guidelines want the, the thought process to be on the front end with the neurologist. Agreed. So th for our first joint um, webcast here, John, working together. So symbolic of working together in the future. I think exciting times. And I think this is just the beginning of, of approaches where um, transcatheter approaches for stroke prevention, um, where neurologists and cardiologists um, are gonna have a, a, a long road together in the future. So it was great to speak with you today. Thank you very much. Happy to be part of the heart brain team. <laughs> Take care and everyone who's tuned in, thank you very much and have a great day.